and a very warm welcome. I am Ruchi Sharma. Ever since the collapse of world's third largest crypto exchange, FTX began on November 6th, there has been a lot of speculation about how it happened, why it happened, who is responsible for it. Was it a massive fraud conspired by Sam Bankman Freed or he just made a genuine mistake and bad decisions? Whatever may be the case, people got hurt. People around the world lost their life savings in the wake of FTX mayhem. And today, for the first time, Sam Bankman Freed has appeared virtually for an interview at Times Deal Book Summit on November 30th, where the New York Times' Andrew Ross Sorkin interviews the former CEO of FTX. Let's listen to what he has to say on his defense regarding the fall of FTX exchange. I made a lot of mistakes or, or things I would give anything to be able to do over again. Um, I didn't ever uh, try to commit fraud on anyone. I, I was excited about the prospects of FTX a month ago. Um, I saw it as a thriving, growing business. I was shocked by what happened this month. And, you know, reconstructing it, uh, where are there things I wish I had done differently? I mean, I'm deeply sorry about what happened. FTX collapse couldn't have happened without co-mingling of funds with the sister company Alameda Research. Earlier this year, Sam Bankman Freed in an interview made it clear that FTX and Alameda Research are two separate companies and they don't even share personnel. But as it turned out, FTX loaned billions of dollars of users' fund to Alameda Research. But as it turned out, FTX loaned billions of dollars of user fund to Alameda Research. Let's hear what Sam Bankman Freed had to say about that. I mean, look, I wasn't running Alameda. I, I didn't know exactly what was going on. I didn't know the size of their position. Um, uh, a lot of these are things I've learned over the last month that I learned as I was sort of frantically digging into this on you know November 6th, November 7th, November 8th. Um, uh, and and uh, obviously that that's a pretty big mistake on Mark. That's a pretty big oversight that I wasn't more aware. Um, I think I was you know scared of. Um, I was nervous uh, because of the conflict of interest about being too involved um, and uh, obviously that shouldn't have meant that I didn't have real oversight um, or that and it really shouldn't have meant that I failed to appoint anyone to be in charge of that oversight, that relationship. Um, but I, I haven't been running Alameda. I, I haven't been you know, thinking about its finances. I haven't been you know, making uh, those decisions, uh, uh, but you know, as CEO of FTX, it was still my duty to make but sure that it. someone was doing diligence. Um, FTX had been a you know profitable, growing business, um, and I was that was more than a full time job. I didn't have the bandwidth to run two companies at once. I didn't have the you know attention for it, um, and and again, I, w I was nervous about a conflict of interest between those two. And so was pretty intentional about not being uh, very involved in what was happening at Alameda. Sam Bankman Freed, ex CEO of embattled crypto exchange FTX, gave his first virtual interview at Times Deal Book Summit on November 30th, where the New York Times' Andrew Ross Sorkin interviewed him about the collapse of FTX. Let's hear what Sam Bankman Freed had to say about how it all started and when did he figure out there was a problem. Uh, the time that I really knew there was a problem was November 6th. Um, November 6th was, uh, that was the date that the uh, you know tweet about FTT came out. And uh, by, by late on November 6th, we were putting together all of the da data, putting together all the information that uh, obviously I should have put together way earlier, that obviously should have been part of the dashboards I was always looking at. And um, I, you know, when we looked at that, um, there was a potential serious problem there. And I, you know, Alameda's position was big on FTX. It had just taken a huge hit. Um, it had taken hits over the course of the year, but that was a particularly, you know, large and, and one and very abrupt. Um, and we're seeing a run on the bank start, and that was leading to, um, I, you know, four billion dollars a day of client withdrawals, 
Um, at that point, you know, we started calling prospective, you know, sources of financing because I was, I was nervous about what was going to happen there. Um, you know, if you rewind even a few days, um, I was, I was a little bit nervous, but not on nearly the same scale. And I, I was thinking about, uh, you know, risks that were substantially less. Uh, when you say, that, when you say you were nervous, way. you were nervous the company was going to go under, you were nervous you were going to get caught. What, what were you nervous about? Uh, on, on, like on November 6th or before then? Either. Either. So I think before then, what I was nervous about was that basically, um, I, and, and this started, I would say November 2nd or so, when there was, uh, you know, like the Alameda balance sheet, um, you know, through Coindesk and, um, and when I started, uh, to, to think, uh, a bit more about this, um, you know, I was nervous that that would lead to uh, substantial losses for Alameda, um, and that uh, you know it would be a bit messy. I didn't think it was existential for FTX. I didn't think it was going to lead to a you know massive loss for FTX's customers. Um, I was thinking of this as um, more like Alameda is going to be really tight on funds, and. Uh, uh, and that, you know, maybe it would end up having some small impact on FTX, but not, not a significant one, not one that hurt customers at all. Um, uh, when you're talking about November 6th, late November 6th, then, and, and especially as we bleed into November 7th and 8th, I start to become nervous that FTX is not going to be able to fill customer withdrawals. And, you know, by, by late November 6th, I am very nervous about that. And I'm starting to think about like uh, emergency scenarios. And I'm starting to think about like things might, uh, things might end quite badly here. And, and, and the core metric that I'm thinking of there is, will we be able to make sure all customers are whole? And, you know, uh, on November 5th, I was feeling quite good about that on uh, November 7th, I was feeling quite uneasy about that. A day after SBF tweeted about FTX financial health, things started to move fast and the scenario turned very quickly. So things were changing fast. And, you know, when you look at, at November 6th, I was feeling nervous, but I felt like things were probably going to end up okay. We still had, I mean, you know, assets way larger than liabilities and um, uh, and yeah, there is increasing withdrawal demand, but we were meeting all of it. We were processing all of it, although it was a weekend. So we were a day delayed on a lot of wire transfers and stable coin creations and Bitcoin node was overloaded, but you know, there are assets we're continuing to process. By November 8th, um, I did not think the odds were that high that we were going to be able to meet all client demand. and. I was worried that there was going to be a substantial liquidity shortfall. November 7th, that was sort of the transition day. And, you know, even just the start versus the end of November 7th, I felt, I felt fairly different. Um, you know, and uh, I can't remember exactly what I was thinking or, 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 or when I sent that, but, you know, I remember trying to think about feeling conflicted about what to say and trying to think about what I could say that I believed. And, um, you know, by, by not that long later, I no longer believed that I no longer, that no longer felt like it had much, like that was a, a at all reasonable representation of where my mind was at. And uh, I don't remember exactly when I deleted it, but I remember at some point it's like, that ah, it shouldn't be there. SBF realized that FTX situation has started moving beyond his control. He decided to file for bankruptcy protection. In the middle of the process, the company was hit by illegal transfer of funds. SBF was completely oblivious to that. So. Uh, I will caveat this by saying, at that point, I was being cut off from systems. And so I'll, I'll, I'll give you the answer to the extent that I know it, um, which is that I believe that a few different things happened within a short period there. Um, I think that uh, the uh, US team took actions to seize some of the assets and put it in custody um, from the exchange. Um, I believe that the um, uh, it has been announced that um, you know the Bahamian uh, regulators um, took some of the assets into safekeeping as well, 
um, around that same time. Um, and I think there may have, in addition to both of those, also been uh, some actually improper access uh, of assets on the exchange. And I don't know the details of that. I don't have uh, the resources to trace through exactly what happened there. Um, and I don't know who is behind that third part. Improper access, that's what SBF said in his candid response. Pretty surprised, but yes, that's what he claimed to a query whereabouts of funds. He was candid enough to accept his stupidity when he answered to tweets. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it was a, a frustrating series. It was not meant to be a, a public interview. It was a longtime friend of mine who I stupidly uh, forgot was also a reporter. Uh, I thought I was speaking in a personal capacity. Um, uh, I'm not sure what they thought the capacity was at the time, but it certainly ended up uh, being reported on. Um, and, you know, I think what I'd say is, look, um, uh, there are a lot of things that I think have really massive impact on the world. And ultimately, that's what I care about the most. And I mean, I think that, I think, frankly, that, that you know, the blockchain industry could, you know, could have substantial positive impact. But... SBF touched upon several other issues, including key investors financing FTX to his property in Bahamas and parents' reaction after he filed for bankruptcy protection. He ended the conversation with stay optimistic in the future. So, what is my future? Um, I don't know what my far future is. And, you know, when you fast forward, I have no idea what I'm going to be doing, you know, a long time from now. I think when I look at, you know, at the near and medium term, what am I thinking? What I'm thinking is, and again, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, and it, a lot of it's not in my hands at this point. Um, but I, uh, I want to be helpful wherever I can to regulators, administrators, you know, internationally who are working to, uh, you know, to help FTX's customers. And I want to be helpful wherever I can on anything that could help bring a lot more value to those customers. And Some hopes for cryptocurrency investors in the end. As we know, at the end, there is always a new beginning. That's all in the special story. This is me, Ruchi Sharma, signing off. Do like, share and subscribe to 3 TV. Have a great day.